Has the meeting started? I don't have any audio. I can't hear the meeting. Just for everybody yeah, who's online, we're going to give it just a few minutes before we get started. I've got somebody coming in to the board or to the committee, whatever it is we are, <laughs> in just a couple of minutes. So we'll start at 10 after. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for that.
Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just confirmation that you can hear us okay online. I can hear you. Excellent. All right, let's go ahead and call to order the meeting of the long range planning committee. We'll start with roll call starting on my left here. Jody Pat. Alicia Fuller with CHP. Jeff Logan, Heartland Communications. Casey Young, Cal Nina. Do we have anybody online from the board? All right, excellent. And we do have Erin Riley who will be arriving momentarily. Let everybody online know when she has arrived. Uh, the next agenda item is approval of the previous meeting minutes. Uh, we just learned that not everybody on the board received those meeting minutes, so I think they everybody has them now. Um, but I'd ask that we hold those until the next meeting so that we have time for everyone to review and make any edits. Any objections to that? No objections. Um, who sends the minutes out normally? Is it Samantha? If you could just make sure myself in case you're on the updated email list. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along to item number three, the recruiting and retention information development discussion with regard to the study that Cal OES has been conducting. All right, Paul's pulling that up right now. It's a very hot microphone. Stand way back here. Casey, I can feel your pain now. Okay. Give me a little less juice, Samantha. <laughs> Blow everyone's eardrums out. All right, that's better. Thank you. OK, um, so data collection has been completed for the staffing study for the uh, for the initial portion. Uh, we had 695 individual call takers and dispatchers surveyed uh, that responded. So very, very good number. We're very happy about that. Uh, 64 PSAP managers responded. So also very good. Um, <clears throat> the. Well, clear up this slide later. Uh, data currently being, is currently being evaluated still. Uh, so the 911 authority team is digging through all of the information right now uh, to start to parse it out and get us uh, some relevant uh, information out of that. Um, <clears throat> they're on task. We'll have that draft report uh, ready at the end of this month. So I think there was talk at the last LRPC meeting of doing a one off just to go through that right prior to the next uh, advisory board. So, uh, you know, I don't know who's responsible for getting that scheduled and on the books, but we can do that and, and we'll have that ready probably. Uh, yeah, so end of this month, so beginning of June, we should have that available for you. Excellent. When is the next regularly scheduled LRPC meeting? Sam, do you have an a... August. August. Yeah. Uh, do we want to aim for June or July? I, I'm in support of as long as the you know draft is ready for that. Um, did you say July? I would say July would probably work better. OK, we'll coordinate with everyone for a July date for a one off meeting. Perfect. Uh, Samantha, Samantha, sorry, Samantha, will you reach out to everybody to for a date to coordinate? OK, we'll look for an email from you. Thank you. Uh, so right now, uh, just digging, like I said, through the data, um, the 911 authority team is briefing us out on that uh, weekly. Uh, we're finding some very interesting facts already and some 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 good data that we think we can pull from. Um, discrepancies in, in perception is a really big one that we're already seeing. Uh, so, for example, uh, what was the number here? 62 percent of call takers or dispatchers reported uh, the reason for leaving the job, uh, citing uh, primarily management. And on the management side, they reported uh, that they felt this only occurs in 5% of cases of people leaving. So very interesting perceptions, right? And I think that everyone can draw their own conclusions or or, or whatever, inferments, but uh, certainly some good data we think that'll come from this report. So, um, <clears throat> And then the largest reported reason for dispatchers, call takers uh, leaving uh, that we've seen is uh, mental health and wellness. So that, that seems to be the predominant factor in people leaving the job. So interesting uh, information coming out so far. Uh, should be should be a good uh, report to to uh, dig through come July. So excited to have that have that ready for you. Well, 
Excellent. Thanks so much. Any questions at this time on that agenda item? Comments? All right, let's move on to policy based routing topic number four um, and the discussion of the draft document that the LRPC uh, developed. And um, next steps for that document. I'll turn it over to to you, Jeff, because you developed that draft and it's fabulous and we appreciate it. So yeah, so as a follow up from uh, last meeting, uh, we talked about uh, you know as the LRPC, you know where where can we lean in and help? Where can we help with the overall scheme of the project going on throughout the state with the next gen nine one one? And and we realized that with um, pol policy based routing, there's a there's a lot out there. And how do we develop a document that might help a PSAP manager or PSAP director who are coming up to these uh, forks in the road of like what do I choose? Uh, for this. Um, so we put together um, some kind of ideas and some options. Um, and I, I know after I uh, put that initial draft together, uh, we attended uh, Cal Nina. And uh, one of the things um, that really helped out sitting in there is, uh, you know, one of the gentlemen here, Paul, uh, gave a great uh, discussion of kind of the roadmap. And I think some more things in his discussion helped kind of open up uh, a few more eyes and definitely help me understand a little bit better to where even that draft document, I can make some enhancements to um, for where we go forward. But this was also talked um, at each of the regional task force meetings um, over the past uh, month or so. And uh, I know that we came up from the Southern Region Task Force with an idea of uh, maybe taking that document or at least something here from the uh, LRPC and discussing maybe even if it's just a list of, you know, pick your own options when it comes to that, uh, you know, fork in the road for all of the PSAPs. Um, I, I do understand uh, one of the things that when I mentioned that we learned a little bit from uh, Paul on there is that this really is a decision point for, you um, when we get onto the next gen system. I, I think the, at least some of the discussion during the last LRPC meeting uh, um, was that this is a decision point that we'd be looking at when we switch over to the new uh, cloud hosted CPE. And that's kind of how uh, some of the discussion started, but you know, this is really a little bit further down the road with this with uh, once we get onto the next gen system. So we have time, but I think our group here can help provide uh, some information to all of the PSAPs out there. And that's where, what started with that document. And I'll close out my statement on there is that uh, I'm happy to continue working on that or do anything else that we need as a group uh, with that. Excellent. Um, I just had an opportunity very recently to sit down with my team. So I have some notes that I can add to the document as well. Um, but yes, in terms of next steps, has OES had a chance at all to look at the document yet through the regional task force discussions? I can I can talk just a little bit about that from the regional task forces. We didn't, uh, at least in the southern region, and I know it was uh, repeated other ones, is we didn't go through the document. We just pulled out a couple of topics for discussion. So I don't think each uh, task force has gone through it in great detail. It was more the highlights. Okay, perfect. Um, how about proposing the draft document to Cal OES at our one-off by the time we get to the one-off meeting? I'm happy to re re take any notes that we have and the things that I've learned as well, and then bring it forward as a document for review at the July meeting. Sounds yeah. great. At least get it to OES by that meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the document as it sits right now is it's it's very high level, so it doesn't go into a lot of detail in terms of a menu of here are the things you might choose from from a policy-based routing perspective, it lists considerations by type, essentially. Um, for OES, not having seen the document yet, do you also want us to move to the point where we are hypothetically suggesting specific scenarios where this would be used other than categories of scenarios? I would say, yeah, okay. and do both see value in that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, realistic examples are what the PSAPs are going to look for anyways, right? I and mean, would it apply to me? Perhaps a small, medium, large. 
type type of uh, scenarios with that fire law enforcement you know there's 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 different things we could cover with hypotheticals i think that would help Okay, so I think we can add maybe a table onto this of some of those scenarios that fall into each category based on, you know, hypothetically what we think could be possible in the future, just general high level scenarios. I'm happy to start on that. I would even suggest, Alicia, if um, you pick maybe one or two of the most common ones that you guys circulate among yourselves and then even bounce that off with the next gen providers and maybe one or two of the call handling providers to really test that scenario in the lab to see you know how, how that all plays out could we coordinate with to usher that communication the testing of the scenario mm -hmm. or for the conversation and the testing the com yeah i mean you could circulate with me and then we can work through the team Okay, um, topic number five is the policy-based routing request list review. So we've already been talking about that with topic number four. Um, so I'm gonna kind of combine those two together. Is there anything else regarding policy-based routing or the document and list that LRPC is working on before we move on? All right. I don't have any nothing else. Idea. I think that that covers it. But the takeaway is, I think uh, the next July meeting, whenever that is scheduled, that's where we review the document and the scenarios, right? Okay. Yes. Um, let's just so because we don't have that date yet for that meeting, uh, would it be reasonable for all of us to have that to OES by June thirtieth? Yes. Okay. Which in turn. Uh, it'll be much more than that. I'll, I'll work uh, early June to get it circulated here to the task force members for addition and uh, edits. Perfect. All right, let's move on to topic number six, which is regionalization and consolidation discussion. Any updates or specifics from OES? you'd like to talk about? I'm sure we're clear to talk. <laughs> uh, well, so we've been having individual, obviously, discussions with PSAPs. It's it's not common, but it but it uh, it happens, right? PSAPs contact us and are interested. Um, we have not made uh, adjustments to the policy to reflect any changes for you know consolidation or or uh, regionalization uh, but we're always talking about it and one of these days we'll pull the trigger on that uh, right now we're we're focusing our efforts obviously on next gen and on the deployment so uh, regionalization hasn't been um, uh, an, an, a topic of of general discussion however uh, we did get some exciting news the other day the uh, la county sheriff's department reached out to us and they want to consolidate it down from 22 centers down to two so that will be a really, really big one for us. We're very excited uh, to have met with them and talked through it. And they're very serious about it. So it's not a, not a uh, hypothetical or theoretical. They they are actively uh, engaging in in uh, in um, procuring sites and getting things going. So uh, it was a pretty good discussion. We talked to that, talked through that, which led to some interesting uh, points for us to. It was a it was a good exercise to talk through because um, we have uh, potential federal grant funding coming up. Uh, right so the the ng911 um, uh, initiative that's going through the federal government right now so there could be quite a bit of money uh, on the table for uh, the state to to spend and and uh, one of the topics that came up was using potentially using some of that money to uh, incentivize regionalization or uh, consolidation so uh, that that kind of came from that conversation with the sheriff's department it was very exciting so um, more to come uh, there, I mean, their timeline's a little bit far out. They've got a couple of years. And it's a big, big agency, big department. There's a lot of work 
that has to go on behind the scenes, but uh, they're looking at uh, three to three to eight years to get it done, depending on whether or not they use an existing site or have to break ground on a new facility. So, so those have been very fruitful conversations, and uh, it's it's led us to talk a little bit internally about what we can do uh, potentially uh, to continue to incentivize or to uh, to help these apps to regionalize. Yeah. So at the last uh, 911 advisory board meeting, um, there was a request from uh, one of the advisory board members uh, back towards the long range planning committee about uh, keeping this as a topic for discussion of um, regionalization and consolidation discussion. And um, I guess from the LRPC position, you know, like, how can we help with that? Like, what is it that, um, you know, we can look towards? I know we talked um, at some of our uh, regional meetings that um, if there's some way that we can help, of course, I think that everyone here wants to make sure that we're helping out the state 911 office and, and doing some of the project work that is, you know, focus on our 911 industry and all of the PSAPs in the state. <clears throat> but this is just like a, an incredibly hard uh, discussion, I think, to have because, you know, when you look at regionalization, you know, more more often than not in consolidation, it's it's more no's than it is yeses. And um, if, if there's not a desire for it, we're not sure like where to open up that door. Um, but I know the one thing that has been a, a positive, I think that would get a lot of traction is that, if there was funding or a way for facilities, I think if facilities were a part of a discussion, then it, it leans more people into something uh, along those lines. So um, I'm just mostly looking forward, like if there's anything you guys are working on that you know of that we can help with, we, we want to be a part of it. I'm just not even sure where to start with this. Yeah, and and, and frankly, I mean, this, this discussion is perfect for this board, right? I mean, we're supposed to be talking about issues three to five to 10 years out, right, as a long range planning committee. Um, and, and this is something I think that the state should be working on. Now that we're working towards, um, you know, deploying next gen 911, uh, that's that's today, right? That's what's happening now. Uh, this is something I think that we should be focused on for the next few years. So we have, you know, uh, we have time to to really sit through and talk about this. But I, I would say that from the OES side, um, what we would be interested in in hearing from the LRPC or from from the members is what what do PSAPs want from us what what can we do jeff you just mentioned facilities it's a really good start right that's something that that we can start to to take a list down of what what can we provide and then of course we go back to looked at the warren act and what we can what we can fund and what we can support and uh if we have to do any policy modifications that, that's easy right legislation modifications are a little tougher but um but if we have to modify the policy to to help uh to pay for things that that these centers may need uh, we're happy to do so the problem that what was that? That was that was Sam bumping the board. Uh, yeah. Sorry, you can have the day off next week. Uh, the problem that we run into is uh, is when you when you talk incentive incentivizing peace apps, you you know we can talk through facilities and incentivizing the agencies who are consolidating. Uh, but we don't have a way to incentivize the the PSAPs who are giving up that that control, right? Or giving up that that jurisdictional uh, command that they that they frankly that they want and want to hold on to. So when you talk to a PSAP that maybe is the maybe the big fish in that pond and is and is bringing all the the satellites in, that's an easier discussion. Okay, what do you want? What can we get for you? Whether it's a building or it's chairs or it's you know new equipment, that's an easy conversation. Uh, the harder one is is how do we how do we convince the the PSAPs who are giving up that that sense of control or that or that that jurisdiction? How do we how do we get to them and how do we help them and what do we incentivize for them? Because, you know, our policy dictates we pay for 911 equipment, for 911 goods and services. If they're not going to be in the 911 game anymore. Then that that makes it tough for us. So that that's something that we would like to hear from you know if if you guys can can kind of think on that and and uh, help us with uh, you know some some perspective ideas of what we can do for those folks. Uh, that would be that would be helpful. And then I would just add, I think there's two asks here. Um, short term, we have at the federal level some next year 911 funding. It's been on at the federal level for four or five years, and they they get it to a point, and then it it dies out. <clears throat> Those conversations have started again. 
if they can get it pulled across the finish line, just thinking globally on a timeline, if let's say mid August it gets approved, it's going to take a year for them to build the grant program. And then we'll get the NOFO, we'll submit, and it'll be six or nine months from there before we get notified that if we've been approved that grant. So we've got 18 to 24 months where the ask is if, if we get a, a large NG911 grant from the feds, we can definitely use it to support next gen deployment. However, in California, we're funded strong for that deployment. So internally, we've talked about how could we incentivize the use of technology for regionalization? Um, and it, it, it's a tough, touchy subject. Um, if you remember, probably back in 2015, 2016, the OES started this conversation with the uh, LRPC then and talked about, <clears throat> and I think uh, Director Gary Laducci's direction at the time it was like six million two hundred and fifty three thousand piece apps in california he said you got to get that, that number down I, it's like four, he said 58 one per county yeah uh, but it was like 460 470 piece apps at the time um and there was a there was a very direct push to get that number down when the lrpc members went out and started to bring up the subject it, it got to be very touchy it's very sensitive and we want to respect that. However, with technology, it's very easy for us to regionalize, um, especially now with CAD systems, we can get into either the data sharing platform or uh, CAD integration where where we can validate that CAD to CAD interface does work. Radio systems, uh, the state's radio system we know works and is available throughout the state. Uh, so some of those issues from 2015, 2016 have been solved today. Um, so short term, is there a way if we did receive NG911 grant funding that we can incentivize maybe a few? You know, right now we're at 447. Can we get down to 400? Just not saying that's an ideal number, just put a target out there. And then long term, how do we how do we reduce that and get into logical um, PSAP operations, and maybe the staffing study provides us some of those tools and resources that help facilitate this conversation. Um, so, you know, long term, that that's where we set. Um, and then, ideally, is, is this an absolute no go? Uh, if it is, why? And, and if there's incentives, I think to Andrew's point, um, if you have a, a local police chief who's going to lose dispatchers who are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week at a front counter for their community to go knock on the door and see somebody, what incentive can we give them? So for us out in Stanislaus County, we have this issue going on right now. We have a lot of satellite PSAPs that are very small for the larger organization. And you're exactly right. They don't want to give up their control. That chief doesn't want to give up his control over the PSAP. Um, so it's a good question you bring up that how do we incentivize those that aren't going to be part of a piece that but maybe we can look towards equipment money towards mobiles uh new technology for them um i know one of our agencies in county that's a huge incentive right now for them to want to move to a new provider and actually create their smaller piece app is because they're receiving an incentive for their equipment Is there a set number uh, that OES is looking for in terms of how small you want a PSAP to be? Do you want to be like a minimum of 10 and everybody that has less than 10 dispatchers we should regionalize or anything like that? There's no recommendation yep. or anything from OES on what that should look like? We haven't put a number on anything. Obviously, uh, we haven't got that deep in the conversations, but I will say that that over half of our PSAPs are three positions or less. So of the 440 that we have in the state, uh, that's a lot of small PSAPs. So. Thanks. That's good to know. I didn't know yeah, that. yeah. Um, it may be good to have a refreshed list if you have it handy of number of PSAPs and position count. Of uh, is that good enough number of number of PSAPs, and like the range that you based on the funding, how many fall into each of those ranges? 
Sure, that's easy. Uh, are you looking at the, the age old question positions purchased or positions funded? Because it's a very different number sometimes. Can, do you, if you have both, can you do a we do both? Yeah. Okay. I think we can provide that. The public data. And it can be you have the data. Yeah, yeah, it's public. Okay. Okay. And I think you can like whitewash it a little bit just so that we have oh, yeah. an idea yeah. of you know their funding amounts of what they bought. To go into this <laughs> small, you know, two to three hundred are in the small, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I think that would be helpful for us to all look at. Um, I know last time we talked about getting the staffing study so that we can initiate a more in-depth conversation on the topic. If there's anything to learn from the staffing study that would help with that conversation. Um, I'm hearing that it's almost like we need a roadmap, not only defining what are the needs that, that the PSAPs need from OES, um, on both sides, the folks that are starting and taking on the re regionalization and those that are giving up um, control. But it also sounds like we need a roadmap for the PSAPs of how you would get there. And LA may be a great opportunity to be able to develop that roadmap. We have some good consolidations that have taken place in the community in the past that exist today that function very well. Um, but we're going to actively go through a consolidation that is massive if LA County moves forward. So it would be nice to see if we can, I don't know, leverage a resource within LA County to help us to, to document everything that they're doing along the process. And we could identify needs through that process that we won't otherwise know exist, um, but also be able to hand that off to a region or a PSAP that is interested and say, here, here's the roadmap of how to get from point A to point B. That may be a way that we can all help with that process. I feel like uh, <clears throat> I might go off the rails here a little bit. So uh, steer me back if I if I'm like going out of our lane here. But, you know, one of the things is I hear about, you know, our discussion on this, and this is only my second meeting here with the LRPC. So I'm, I'm still kind of learning exactly what, um, what all our responsibilities are. But, you know, all due respect, you know, to some of the recommendations, especially Andrew of like, you know, take something back and think about it. And like, I'd like to see us have like more action on something. I don't want to go think sure. about something. I'd rather us have something that we can work on. You want homework. And, and and I'm not trying to like make more work for myself because I feel like we've got enough going on. But if if we're gonna be up here and working, like how how better can we help? And I don't want you know your team to feel like you have to you know give us direction what we're doing. If we just have like a high level of this is what we need done, and then like turn us loose sure. to work on it, we'll be happy to uh, go with that. And uh, that, that's it. Yeah. I would like to say we would like the LRPC to provide some input on how we can. Uh, approach the subject of consolidation. I, and then, you know, seriously, I, I that is, I'm just too nice, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I think for the July meeting, if you can come prepared to say, you know, this task is going to take us a couple of meetings. In, in, historically, we've had two off cycle meetings. You'll have a July meeting. We, this could be just a really quick, topic and focus primarily on the staffing study. But let's start to outline what does that timeline look like? I think that that would be the first thing. Um, and then what is it that we are looking to achieve? I, I guess what what do we want to achieve first? And then what is the estimated timeline for this? And then report that in the August advisory board meeting as, as the due out because the the long range planning committee, you don't you work in collaboration with the OES team, but you're actually responsible to report back to the advisory board. So your recommendations will get vetted through us, but ultimately reported to them. Um, and then the advisory board can then modify, accept, or, and take action based on your recommendations. So from the do outs there, then look at short term. If we did get grant funding, how could we incentivize quick? Uh, and I use the example of LA County. It'd be very easy for us that right in the middle of this uh, planning, 
we can go down and we can we can help facilitate that discussion. You know, is there a way that maybe Cal Fire CHP could we? I'm not saying we have to. I'm just using those ex as examples. Um, you know, obviously for somewhere like San Diego, probably not the smartest thing because the busyness. Um, unless they took an LAPD model, but then you know, what is the operational cost? You know, you, you things to consider. Um, you know, I would say start from there, and then let's build some some milestone dates to deliver information. Um, probably first in draft to OES, and then in, in final draft to the advisory board. Uh, that that all makes sense. Uh, one question that I have for the group, and I know that we don't have uh, you know the attorneys normally here, like for the uh, 911 advisory board meeting, but do we have any limitations on how we meet uh, when we meet like like we do like we do the brown act or something like that is that it, it's really hard at least from what i've seen so far is that we meet here once a quarter and then we all disperse and we we have other things going on and are we allowed to meet virtually to just talk about the specific items that are on here that we're coming up with a game plan on or does it have to wait until this meeting here great question so a little bit of history on the long range planning committee back when the 911 advisory board was established in the uh, Warren Act. There was a lot going on. The state didn't have a next gen plan. They really didn't have a strategic plan. So the advisory board was enacted to help facilitate that and then also um, provide advice back in in evaluation of what the state 911 office is doing. Well, because of those requirements, the Bagley Keene requirements, the advisory board members could not meet outside of that meeting to get work done. So anytime they did work, they had to do it with the pomp and circumstance of an official meeting with an attorney present, the approved agenda, only staying to those agenda items. So they were like, well, this really doesn't work. This, this really hurts us. Let's create a committee of advisory board members absent one member that doesn't create quorum and doesn't meet the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act requirements. We'll still host those meetings with that that same requirement absent the attorney and a little bit more freedom in our agenda in our talking points. So this group can be tasked by the advisory board to go do I, when I was on the LRPC, we always called it, we rolled up our sleeves and got work done. We gave it to the advisory board who briefed it out and took action. Um, so that's what your job is, is to take the recommendations from the advisory board or to develop a recommendation um, as, as this committee. Get that work done. When you leave here, as long as you're meeting and, and talking amongst the committee members, you're not violating Bagley Keene. Now, if you do try to reach out to advisory board members and you go, you know, from Chief White to um, the next chief and then, you know, to the CHP chief, that creates a problem. That creates a serial meeting. You can't do that. Now, each of you can go to your respective advisory board members to provide them an update. Now, Alicia, you only have one member. Everybody else should have two. I think fire and uh, sheriff still are absent one member uh, in the NAPCO only has one representative. I, I think on the, the complexion of the board. But as a, a sitting LRPC member, you can report to your advisory board member anytime you can meet with them. You can get feedback. You just can't start calling everybody else. So once our meeting's done here. Work. Super helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Just to add on to that too, if also what has come out of the past are the task forces and the working groups. So we've done PSAP, we've done PSAP consolidation in the past as a working group to have that conversation. It was a long time ago. Um, we've done working groups to discuss changing residual spending items. So if the work becomes greater than what can be accomplished with this group and needs a focus group, 
that's also an option as well, which is kind of how the next gen task forces came about also. So if we decide that we've defined a workload and now we need more people to do that workload, we can talk about a larger group of people. I think it's been you know about a dozen in the past. My I, comments would be um, along those lines that Jeff is talking about taking action you know, offline and, and working it and to, to Paul's point on assigning a task, I think. Um, when I hear like OES can incentivize, right, what does that really mean? And and part of doing that homework, I would think, is to circulate that question among various PSAPs, whether it's LASD or small agencies or large, both from the perspective of those taking them on versus those giving it up and really identify what incentivizing really means so that we have the um, ability to either provide those services through the means of funding or technology or whatever it may be. It's just hard to really say, hey, we can incentivize these PSAPs if we don't really define what the incentive is. And so to me, that should be part of that homework assignment that you guys come up with through the documentation and, uh, you know, of, of those kind of items that PSAPs consider as value added incentives. I mean, no, that's, that's good. And I, and I think a, a lot of the discussion here helps. And uh, I, I probably should have asked this question last meeting. I, I just didn't quite realize. I thought we were on the impression that we were limited on how many people could meet together or how often we could meet. And uh, now that we know we can meet often to get through some of these topics, I, I think we can, uh, you know, power right through it and bring some good recommendations. Thank you. I think that kind of leads into what Alicia is saying. We could take those kind of um, pieces of information that you guys have gain through talking to PSAPs that are interested in uh, consolidation and then circulate that among the task force members to see what their feedback is. Is that something that they align to or do they give it, you know, other feedback that we could present back to the LRPC? Kind of goes along the same lines of policy based routing. It's the same kind of template in my mind. You guys come up with the details and kind of the, 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 the template, right? And then we can circulate that to the task force members. Same goes to regionalization and the concept there. Excellent. I, I do think we should take advantage of what LA County is about to embark upon though, and identify somebody in LA County who could work directly with sure. us. We, we've, we've talked to them uh, already and we do have some folks we're working with. I would caution that due to the size of the agency uh, that we may run into limitations as to how useful their, their model is because they're I mean, once they're two centers, they're going to be gigantic. So um, that that will be our only kind of limiting consideration. But yeah, absolutely. We'll talk to them. Okay. Alicia, were you part of the working group before that looked at consolidation? No, I. I sat in a lot of the meetings regarding, I think, the. Changing of funding. Um, but. Consolidation was too long ago for me to remember, other than the fact that there really was no appetite for it at the time. And I, I think a lot of that comes down to technology limitations, too, that, of course, nobody wants to give up power, but there wasn't the technology to allow multiple organizations to have power together, essentially. And it just seems that as you're participating in events like Calnina and APCO events, the topic is coming up and it's not scaring people off quite the way it did. Uh, folks are willing to actively have a conversation about working together. And they, uh, you know, through all the fires and everything that we've had in California, that mutual aid understanding has also gotten a lot more tightly defined. And people understand that you have to rely on your communities around you. So I, I there was just no appetite for it several years ago. It seems there is now. I think another thing that, um, you know, we all bring different perspectives of this and where it would be good to work together is that, you know, um, I typically coming from the fire uh, side of things don't uh, consider how many small PSAPs there really are. And I think that's an eye opening thing. You know, so then you start to think of, you know, all of our PSAPs in the state that have, you know, um, you know, during low call volume hours, you know, they go drop down to like one dispatcher in the center, you know, and the, all the inherent uh, situations that come up with that that you know the consolidation discussion is is a good one to have uh just for 
continuity of operations, if you will. And then, um, but on the fire side, I think where the challenges we've had in the past, um, I can use my own county as an example. So in San Diego County, where I'm at, uh, you know, we we paid a lot of money to consultants to do studies of what's recommended for consolidation. And there's, you know, published documents that recommend uh, consolidation and, and how the consolidation should happen. And uh, even with all of that, it's still, you know, it ran into the problem of politics, politics. people, yeah. uh, MOUs, pay differences, all, all the little, anything that could get in the way got in the way. And uh, so even though there's, you know, great expert opinion says this is the right thing to do, it was still like, you know, um, as far away as possible. And I think we'll probably continue to run into those roadblocks. I mean, it, that's going to happen. The politics are not going to, they haven't changed in that regard. Uh, but if if there's a way that we can overcome at least some of them, right, if we can get some movement, that would be ideal. And I think... Uh, it's a matter of education, right? It's a matter of reaching out. It's a matter of getting hold of of our, as Paul said, of our um, of your uh, respective agencies, right? Cal chiefs, fire chiefs, you know, police chiefs, fire chiefs, sheriffs associations, because that's really where the politics sit, right? That's that's generally the person who's going to really try to throw a roadblock up is going to be the chief, because that's his his or her domain, right? So I think uh, that'd probably be a good place to to start uh, messaging up through your various professional organizations that this is a should be a priority and this should be important for us. Okay, so for our July meeting, while we're gonna focus on the staffing study, I have noted that we'll discuss timeline for some kind of a consolidation plan. I'm using the word plan very lightly um, so that we can determine, you know, that's kind of our next project, right? After we, get through developing something for policy-based routing. Um, and we could define how long we need for that. Does it sound like a plan? Something to consider, just, just based on the last time the LRPC had this topic, um, I think Andrew had just gotten promoted to a, a TSM-1 specialist position and in the LRPC Budget announced. Oh, by the way, Andrew just got promoted, and he's your guy who's collecting all the information about uh, consolidation and regionalization. In that word, it was like wildfire through the PSAPs. So, anytime an LRPC member or an advisory board member was around, they were like, okay, "You don't see me." I've been so. Think about the nomenclature and how we identify this. And regionalization isn't as scary as consolidation. Um, you know, just cautious, say cautiously, we want to be sensitive to the conversation, although we need to have this conversation. So, um, the last time I think the rumors flying through some of the small piece apps was they're going to kick us all out. They're, they're going to make us go, you know, we work at the local PD, we got to go work for the sheriff and they don't pay as much as we do and life sucks. And what am I going to do? None of those conversations happen, but. That that was some of the the fallout from those early conversations we had. So what I picked up from that is that if those conversations happen, we just blame Andrew. Got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fine. And the other thing is we're going to make one fire peace app statewide. And it's going to be a one seat to handle all uh, fire EMD calls. Uh, I'll make sure I pass that on to you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. My name is Andrew Madsen. <laughs> All right, now that we've started a fabulous rumor. <laughs> uh, any fur anything further on the discussion of regionalization? Bring nothing. Move into item number seven, which is the regional task force briefings. Do we have anybody present from a task force who would like to brief us? Well, we got Jeff here. Brian went and we have Janae and that's it. Josh couldn't make it today. He's at a city council meeting, so he's he was unable to uh, get here. So. Okay. You want to start, Jeff? Sure. So uh, let's see here. We met on uh, April 25th for the Southern Region uh, Task Force. We didn't have a um, very long agenda. Um, a lot of our discussion was updates on the uh, pre migrant pre-migration testing uh, that started on uh, February 12th. Um, 87 at that point were completed and um, 
zero of those 87 that were completed were ready um, for uh, OSP. A lot of different reasons uh, for that, and we talked a little bit about it, but one of the things that came out of that uh, discussion is that um, they were looking at, uh, the vendors working on this is setting these up in like transfer clusters. So instead of going um, all over the place, this PSAP, this PSAP over here, this PSAP over here is getting them into uh, clusters. Um, and they were gonna start in a central in Kern County uh, was the area they were looking to start at. Um, the vendor uh, that was selected, Promethean One, uh, to help uh, oversee this project or work hand in hand on this project um, has uh, at that point identified as helped out with the overall organization of the project. And I think it was their discussion about the transfer clusters uh, coming back down and not being uh, so all over the place. And they uh, helped also establish a good tracking method for uh, established uh, issues. Um, that have come up with uh, the pre-migration testing. Um, the group also talked about, uh, we talked a lot about um, the document that was going around or the discussion about um, part our policy-based routing. And uh, so we talked a lot about looking at two different options, alternate answer versus load share. And um, it was just a lot of discussion back and forth. Nothing really landed on it, just open discussion of what it means to other people and some of the experiences they've had. Did I miss anything, Janae? No? Okay, that's it. Excellent. Brian, you want to go next? I mean, Jeff covered it. I mean, it was effectively the same across every one of the regions. He he covered the South, but that was very similar conversations. I mean, the topics didn't change. It was policy-based routing and um, really the, the focus of next gen and these next steps and, and really taking the the approach of changing it from, you know, all PSAPs all at once, get it ready and migrate by the end of the year to a more um, focused approach. And like you said, the, the transfer cluster agencies that um, are trying to go live are the ones that we're focusing on and, and testing those and then finding the issues and going back to resolve those issues without, you know, focusing on other ones across the various regions, which is how we approached it at the beginning of this year and realized very quickly that that was not the recipe for, for success. And so, um, as Jeff stated, Promethean put together the ticketing process to really track some of these known issues and then follow it up with the uh, the resolution and the retest to, to get them ready. And at this point, um, you know, I think there's uh, the Kern County area is the, the area that we're looking to address, I think that and CSU LA, but, um, the the primary focus has been in Kern County with those agencies uh, ready to migrate. And with that approach, I think um, it, it may, you know, I know the objective from the beginning of the year or late last year from Paul and from Budge is that, you know, all the entire next gen project or at least 80% of that project should be complete with the OSPs migrated to every one of the piece after 80% by the end of the year. I think we've come to realize through, um, just just the the testing results as jeff mentioned zero for eight, 92 or whatever that number is is not going to translate to the end of the year and so i think that uh for the lrpc is um kind of you know it, it becomes very realistic as to that's not going to make it so this approach is is something that's more logical anything you guys want to add to that or i know this is just the task force but i mean those are the two topics any questions on that? Janae, do you have anything else to add? OK, excellent. Anybody have any, any questions about the updates? We uh, we would like to take the opportunity to discuss the task forces uh, in a little bit more of a holistic sense for this meeting. Um, so we've talked about this at the task force meetings for some time. Um, I haven't gone in a while since we kind of handed over the keys to Janae and Don um, Ryan with this round, um, but over the last year, uh, and we talked about this at the last LRPC meeting too, the charter as is written is making it very difficult for us to come to the table with relevant conversation topics to engage in based on what the task is of the task force, right? It's it's operational input for next gen 911 implementation, right? We're at the point now where we're implementing um, you know, we we spent several years doing the task forces and we've got great feedback, great conversation. It's been a very useful tool for us. Um, but we are finding that uh, the charter as written isn't really reflecting uh, the 
the mission as as needed now. So, um, and and frankly, uh, the attendance is is reflecting in that as well. We're having a hard time getting getting people at the task force meetings. They're they're getting smaller and smaller. So we think that uh, it's time now to to change course. Uh, so we uh, circled up and talked about it this week. And what we're going to do, uh, OES is going to we're going to leave the task forces on, uh, but they're going to change a little bit in in approach and in um, in sort of an uh, tactic. So what we want to do now is we want to uh, maybe open them up uh, so they're not so small. Uh, we want to open it up to a, to a wider audience. Uh, we want to turn them into something more akin to like a. Uh, a conversational or a, uh, a Q&A focused, uh, like a town hall almost. So we still will be coming out uh, to the regions, talking to the, you know, to the PSAPs, uh, but it's going to be more of, um, you know, it'll be part update, right? Part like information, because we get a lot of requests for town halls. We get a lot of requests for, for information sharing. And frankly, a lot of the town or the uh, task force meetings over the years, there are always members there that are going, well, I just, I just want to know what's going on, you know? Um, so we want to, turn this into something that's more of a uh, uh, town hall style format, but not just an update, not just, hey, here comes the state telling you what, you know, an update on next gen for the umpteenth time. We want to make it you know, the, the thing that makes the task forces go and the thing that the thing that makes them uh, really valuable is the conversation is the back and forth. So we want to try and keep that element active. We want to make sure that people know that this is the this is a meeting where, yeah, we'll open it up so more people can come. Um, and it'll be more of a, an update or an informational, but we do want to maintain that that two way conversation. We want it to be really an interactive style meeting. But uh, the way we see it, uh, the 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 charter as is written, uh, we're we're just we're struggling to get topics. Uh, we're struggling to get attendance. So we we decided that uh, a change was necessary. So we're going to go ahead and uh, modify the format. You're so gonna, you're going to modify the charter too. Yeah, okay. yeah, we'll rewrite the charter on that. Uh, we'll change that up. Um, last time we wrote the charter, we did present it to the LRPC for feedback. Um, the task forces were, uh, we we kind of just dreamed them up and, and created them. Uh, we did want to obviously have, you know, buy in from the from from our boards and everything. So we did present the charter last time for edits and and for feedback and approval. Um, so we'll do the same this time. Want to make sure that you guys are 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 looking at it and okay with it. Um, but and then we'll get through some of the details later. We were talking about cadence, changing that perhaps maybe so not once a quarter, maybe twice a year. We haven't finalized those discussions, but we did want to make sure to let you guys know that uh, it'll be it'll be a different brief out uh, on the on the next LRPC. We'll be doing things a little bit differently. So. Excellent. Um, Kyle, you just thinking about a comparable of not necessarily it's not quite a task force anymore right because a task force is a task it's task and you have a force behind it to do something yeah so maybe like a field advisory committee approach so i mean a lot of us are familiar with a field advisory committee um style approach in law enforcement and um, public safety so something similar that you can relate it back to oh i know what this is my organization has one of these it's where I get updates and I give my feedback, right? That's kind of what we're looking for. So that could be a recommendation yeah. in terms of language or um, an, a style of approach. Janae will take that feedback into consideration when she rewrites the charter. Thanks, Janae. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or feedback on the task force briefing item. One of the things um, I, I guess it ties into this that I was prepared to discuss during uh, agen uh, agenda items for future meetings um, was the ability for the um, LRPC to provide, uh, like for us as we're allowed to work together and meet together a little bit more to provide topics for the task force um, so we can bring suggestions forward. But if you guys are planning to rewrite the charter and uh, change the mission a little bit, maybe it's better we hold off on that for right now and don't bring that forward as an agenda yet. Um, I don't know, it, I guess it depends. I mean, um, 
a lot of the a lot of the requests that we would get uh, when we would you know we would canvas out and ask task force members what do you want what do you want to hear about a lot of them came back to us and and in our perception and looking at them was this is more of an update status or or um, more something that's not necessarily uh, aligning with the charter anyway so i mean uh, we could add it and i think it probably would we could probably make it fit right um, as i mentioned the important thing about these is the conversational nature so if you've got items that need to be discussed i think they're that this is the venue for it regardless of of you know obviously we're changing the format we'll change the charter a little bit but um, i think there will always be room for operational considerations right there's always going to be room for that topic um, and especially if there's questions from the PSAPs, right so I, I think it's probably still appropriate to make it work Okay, that sounds good. I just uh, wanted to try and change, you know, some of the uh, narrative. And I know with the, with us having trans, you know, not that we're transitioning yet, but we're we're reaching the home stretch of the next gen nine one one and and all of the process that the technology task force and LRPC has been with is that I kind of feel um, our and from the technology group and then just with the LRPC that there's a a big pull for information and we're kind of in a silo of like, hey, what should we add to this? Is there anything yeah. you can think of? And uh, the missing piece, I think, is like us talking together to come up sure. with like, hey, what it is. Because here in the meeting on the spot, we might not be able to come up with it, but if we know that that's our agenda going forward, hey, let's come up with a couple of ideas together yeah. and, you know, talk through them. And Casey can tell me, no, that's a dumb idea. And I can say, okay, I won't say that. And then uh, we'll go forward. I think you're right, Jeff. I think um, part of the reason uh, I think there's two reasons that the task force is where it's at now. One is the the membership itself. I think in the very beginning, Andrew handpicked many of the same or many of the individuals that sat on this task force. And those individuals were handpicked because they were engaged in the project. They 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 were um, you know, they were passionate about it. They were they were willing to express their thoughts and ideas and really engage in that two-way conversation. And over the years, um, those individuals either moved on, retired, you know, or replaced on the task force. And those that are coming on either don't have the background of where this project has become or, you know, where it's at now versus where it started. And so the questions that they're asking are very um, high level. Like, do you have status on call handling? You know, not, and, and that's, uh, you know, a good question if you're new, but it's not the 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 deeper level thinking questions. You know what I mean? And so um, to your point, can you talk offline and engage in conversations that maybe are those second level thinking type of questions and then bring that back to the LRPC or to the task force and put those on agenda topics that Andrew and I can talk to. And um, for those that, uh, you know, like you would do the heavy lifting and bring those kind of topics that everyone else can take advantage of. I think that is the model that we use in the very beginning of the task force and and really now, either through transition of resources or because the project has then matured and, and got to a state of we're just migrating OSPs and going through testing. There's not a lot of questions that could be asked, right? It's just we're going to go through this process and then ultimately the, the OSPs are migrated behind the scenes and really it shouldn't be a uh, you know uh, impact to the PSAPs if everything is done appropriately. And so, you know, I think a combination of the resources and really where the project has come is is kind of diluting those questions a little bit from making the, the task force value valuable. Those are my thoughts. Well, to move further on that, I think one thing that I've struggled with in the past, like, you know, since our last meeting is, you know, trying to build out all of my contacts of, you know, like in, in my role here with the LRPC, I represent the California Fire Chiefs Association, right? So trying to reach out to our fire PSAPs throughout the state, who are the point of contacts and let me relay their issues or their challenges that they have on their behalf. I mean, that's why I'm here. And uh, I don't know if, you know, my colleagues here have had great success in in reaching out to their peers that they represent, but it's, uh, you know, it's like the same thing in every piece up, right? It's like people changing positions, people who are, you know, too busy to even answer the email that you said number or reach out. But um, that's where I feel like right now is being a new member here is just trying to reach out to those that, you know, I'm partnered with or that I'm here to represent and get that information to bring forward. And then us as a group can meet together to help bring that stuff forward. So it's not the first time here at the meeting trying to, you know, just go through the agenda and figure out uh, what our answer is. So something that worked for me and then worked for Chris Heron 
and then Charlie Cullen when he was on the LRPC, is instead of trying to reach out to your PSAP peer group, go back to the fire chiefs, go back to the association sponsoring you to be on this, ask to get on their agendas when they're having their big uh, meetings. Uh, when I represented Cal Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Bonner um, would have me sponsored to come to uh, Cal Sheriff's meeting, especially the executive meetings, and do a quick update. What are we doing in LRPC? What are we doing in advisory board? And then Cal Fern was a thing. Um, and then they would take that data back and share with those chiefs and say, this is the update that we're getting as Cal Fire Chiefs or Cal Sheriffs or Cal Police Chiefs. Here's what we need you to go out and data gather. Now that does create a lag because now you're going to be three to six months. But, you know, by the time they give you feedback, we're going to have a meeting scheduled. You've got to go back get clarification. However, over time, that communication does get better, especially if you can get in with those executive assistants or executives uh, in in the fire chief, sheriffs, police chiefs, um, in APCO office, Calnino office. Um, work direct with them and, and they can help funnel some information. And then through there, then you start to find out who your power players are in the PSAP world. And, and I think that's where Andrew started when, when he did the task force assignments. He looked for those power players. Who are, who are those regional leads that, that are trusted? Um, and if you get a couple really trusted experts in a region, then you can start funneling information and they can they can start to be your spokesperson locally. Great feedback, Paul, thank you. Yeah, I think we have to bring it from, you always have to go from both sides, right? Through the associations to, to be able to go top down, but also leveraging these task forces or whatever it is we come to call them um, to be able to bring it from the other side and get that first line feedback, either from the supervisors or the first line themselves as to whether or not our ideas are relevant or idiotic, right? We we want the line level feedback. Um, and that and you don't validate get that from the- What the yeah. executives are hearing. Exactly, yes. I think tackling it from both sides is a great concept. I think I just had more of a question about the task force. So right now we're focused on the next gen project, but if we're looking at, you know, possibly expanding for working groups to talk about consolidation and regionalization, is there a possibility we could keep these task force in place, but kind of change the mission to just be like issues in 911 focused, right? So we can bring whatever issues there are and get the word out that way. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, allow it to be a little bit of a, a mouthpiece, right? For some of the things that we need to that we need to get out there. I think it's not a bad idea. I mean, we can we can be fairly flexible with this. We just want to make sure that we've got the interest, right, of the PSAPs on it. I think that's the the big thing, and and maintaining that, uh, like I was saying, that that two way communication. I think that's a big part of it. So um, if we are, the rest is details. I, I think that we can we can talk through that and and uh, certainly uh, use it for a for a forum for issues, yeah. Have a, an LRPC member attend those perhaps to, so it's not just OES all of the time, right? It becomes kind of white noise. Have one of us attend and talk about a specific topic, May, you know, regionalization, for example. Let's lead a conversation about regionalization with the task force or the committee or whatever it is we're calling them. happy to let you get up and take those knives Alicia <laughs> yeah I mean I'm I am happy to you know sometimes you just need to have a conversation with a different person right yeah. and be able to say okay let's talk about re regionalization hey. what do you hate about it right and then reverse it okay what is appealing about regionalization let's make a couple of lists that way we can then come back and say okay this is what I learned um let's turn these into actionable items And I, I know Andrew always gives me heartache over this, but amongst everything else, he gives me heartache for. Um, so anytime I get the chance to do briefings, I always talk about the LRPC and advisory board and what they do and why they're there, because these are these are positions put in place to represent the 911 community, both on the, the PSAP side and the vendor side, the technology side, and to help guide the state to make sure that that you are watching what we are doing 
and our decisions align with your operations. And when we create the strategic vision, we are aligning getting that feedback. Um, so any chance that I get, especially at the PSAP manager meetings, I always have I have a static slide that talks about the LRPC, the history, and then the advisory board, um, and then those meeting dates. Most of the time it's met, eyes glazed it's over. It's the last slide, Paul, come on, let's go. Um, but I think it's important and if, if we had somebody from the long range planning committee to be able, especially at the first couple, to be there as a representative, to really put a pin in the great work that this group does. And I've been involved with LRPC either as a member or sitting at this side, the state side of the table since 2015. This group does a lot of great work. Um, we have a great opportunity now. You know, next gen's done, you know, that work that was done a few years ago, all of that's put in motion. Now we can create our legacy. And I think with the staffing survey, with um, policy based routing, and with regionalization or consolidation, in to look at how we can improve the footprint of the PSAPs, we can create a legacy for this generation of members and PSAP managers. I'll get off my soapbox. It's beautiful. Very, yeah. <laughs> That was so poetic. <laughs> I'm gonna. You know, I'll need to take a moment. No, that was that's that's good, Paul. We do, we do appreciate that you get the word out when you're speaking at meetings, so that people know that we exist. Someone has to be passionate about this. <laughs> All right. Anything else on this agenda topic? Oh, and, and real quick, because it, it's come up a couple of times, Promethean One, just kudos to Cal OES for taking that leap and bringing Promethean on board. It's early in the stages, but I think the conversations that we have all had with them are very productive. Um, they're going to be a good partner for the state. So good job. Thank you. And just to kind of go off of uh, where Andrew um, kind of teased some of the updates that we have, as of today, just before this meeting, we have four PSAPs in Kern County who have conditional pass ready to migrate carrier traffic. Four of nine PSAPs in that first transfer cluster. More testing is happening today. They're testing in Redondo Beach. Uh, we have two of three PSAPs in LA region who have tested conditional test, conditional pass, but ready with migration with a VoIP carrier scheduled for Thursday in Los Angeles. So Atos will be uh, uh, ingressing some uh, VoIP traffic down at uh, CSULA. And uh, we're looking on how we can start to target the Southern region in parallel with Kern County. As of today, we are targeting the last month of, or the last week of May or the first week of June to schedule carrier migration uh, in that Kern County um, transfer cluster. So um, I'm super excited. They have done a lot of great work. Um, I think most important is they started tracking all of these tickets in the PSAP and they started pushing and getting all of that follow up and all of the retesting. So that's where our success is coming from. So super excited there. It's noticeable. We're excited to retest Bakersfield for CHB. Hopefully it's a pass with flying colors. Fingers crossed. Yes. You go ahead. All right. Moving on to the next item, number eight, agenda items for future meetings. Does anybody on the board or on the committee have any items? I think we've got our plates full. So just for Sammy, when she drafts the next agenda for July agenda, the only items that we're going to have on there is uh, policy based routing. It's a brief agenda topic and the staffing study review by LRPC members and feedback. And a quick five minute discussion about regionalization to define how long we think it might take for us. Thank to you. So three topics. Um, policy based routing, staffing study and the regionalization topics. And then for August. We will revert back to the current agenda that we're working off of today and make sure those topics are all reflected in the August agenda. 
Did they speak slow enough and you capture all those notes? Okay, good. I concur. Thank you, Paul. She had it minutes ago. She was waiting for you to stop I'm, talking. I'm waiting for her to throw something at me. All right, moving right along to topic number nine. Public comment for matters not on the agenda. Any comments from the public? Anybody online? All right. Hearing nothing, we will move to adjournment. We are adjourned. I don't think we need a ruling on that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.